Good morning and welcome to RK Church. So glad you're here with us this morning, yet again online in your living rooms. Uh, if you're new to Arcade, we would love to connect with you. You can text Arcade Guest to 484848 or you can go online to arcadechurch.com where we would love to follow up with you and get to know you a little better. One of the things we get to this morning that I'm super excited about is we get to hear from two of our missionaries in Mexico, Jim and Annie Cole. So check out this video. Iglesias de la Hueste would like to thank you for your support in the midst of this pandemic. Iglesias de la Hueste has taken the opportunity in the midst of this time to work alongside local church partners to feed over a thousand families. We are excited to be able to dedicate more than 20% of our budget over the last two months to see the work of the local church extended into new areas. Our partner ministry, Reflejo, has gone into new communities like the Mixtec community of Ensenada, the Basarero of Tijuana, and a new community in San Juan in the Amazon in Peru. We're excited to see how God is going to use this. In the midst of this time, we also have had unique opportunities to reach out to our partners through online and video classes, continuing to train pastors, continuing to mobilize the church and see the gospel advanced. Thank you for supporting us and giving us the resources we need to love our neighbors well in the midst of the COVID crisis. God bless you. Our missionaries at Arcade are hard at work continuing to do ministry even now in this unusual time. And we would love for you to join us in lifting up their ministries in prayer. Also, if you're in need of prayer, we would love to pray for you. You can text Arcade Prayer to 484848, or you can go to arcadechurch.com slash prayer, and you can put your requests in, and we are praying for you regularly. Let's worship the Lord together. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried. Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious name You called my name And I ran out of that grave 
I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were
Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left to crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Darkness, you give 
will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you. Great are you, Lord. Good morning, Arcade Church. This is Patrick George. I'm so excited. I can't wait to see you all face to face. Uh, I have the privilege of serving RK Church on the Elder Board, and I have two very big pieces of news to deliver to you today. The first is, it is voting time. And this year, because we're all at home, we're going to make it easy for you. We're going to send you your ballot to your house if you are a member of RK Church. It's really important that you know you have to be a member of RK Church, but you will receive an envelope like this. Uh, if you're married, your spouse, and she's a, she's a member, she'll receive one too. Uh, you just complete the uh, ballot in here. And then it's very much like normal. There's a summary of the budget and other ballot items. And then you put it back in the exact same envelope that we sent to you and you put it back in the mail, very easy. And I really encourage you to keep a lookout for this envelope. If you don't get an envelope, please call the church office and within a week or so, uh, they will uh, get back to you and make sure that you do in fact get one. And it just needs to be in before July the 1st. So we got plenty of time, but when you receive it, just go ahead and fill it out and send it back in the mail. So that's that's piece of news number one. Piece of news number two is about Nick Morlett. Nick's standing here with me um, with the full endorsement of the elder board. Uh, I'm so excited that um, Nick's going to be uh, on the ballot as a uh, pastor. We're going to vote on him as a pastor. I got an opportunity to get to know him in the last year and a half, and um, he's a, just an outstanding man, an outstanding person, and a true man of God. And uh, I'm going to let let him tell just a little bit more about himself. Hey guys, it's so exciting that we get to continue to do ministry here at Arcade right alongside all of the rest of the pastors here at Arcade. And so thank you so much uh, ahead of time for allowing us to do this and allowing us to get to know you and get to know your students and uh, having so many opportunities to teach the word and to share with you our heart. Uh, it is just a blessing for the entire Morlet family that we get to be a part of this amazing church. And we can't thank you enough for your support and your encouragement up to now. And we look forward to years and years and years of ministry right alongside you. None of the ministry that's happening here at Arcade could be happening without your faithful giving. And your faithful giving is allowing me to be a pastor, it's allowing Patrick to be an elder, and it's allowing all the ministry that we're doing, whether in person or online, to happen. So we thank you so much for that continual and faithful giving. And you have an opportunity again to give this morning. There's four ways to give. You can do it online. You can download the app and do it through the app. You can text or you can mail in. And we're so blessed to be able to do ministry with the money that you're giving. So let's pray for that right now. Father, uh, you are good, Lord, and you are providing for your ministry to happen, for your word to go out continually. And we thank you for that. And we ask this morning, God, that you would bless this offering and that you would continue to bless the ministries of Arcade as we work and serve in your glory, Lord, in your name. 
Amen. Amen. Thanks, Nick. So, Arcade Church, hope you guys have a great week. Prepare yourself to listen to a great sermon. Can't wait to see you face to face. Good morning, Arcade family, and I'm so glad that you're joining us on Arcade Online. Uh, I don't know about you, but it seems like every week I just thoroughly enjoy uh, the worship team, the songs they lead us in. Uh, Debbie and I just absolutely enjoy worshiping together. Really wish we could worship with you, and someday we will, and we're looking forward to that day. In the meantime, it seems like every day that goes by this quarantine, what is it, week 85 right now? It seems like there's a new layer of weird turned over, and we just don't know what's going to happen from day to day. And I just want to get right into it. It leads us to ask the question, especially those of us who are followers of Christ, what exactly is God doing? What is he doing in this world? We, we know the whole thing about COVID. We've read all the websites. We know all the conspiracies. We probably believe some of them. And we, we know what's going on there. We know it started somewhere in China, whether it's a wet market or a laboratory. Don't know at this point. Don't care. But all we know is that something's going on with COVID-19. And we recognize that. Also, just so you know, uh, I'm recording this on June 1st. It's going to go online today, June 14th. And in June 1st time, there are all kinds of riots going on in response to the death, of the very unfortunate death of George Floyd. And so there's nothing but riots going on throughout our whole country. We know why that's happening as well. And then on top of that, it's election year. Like that makes it better. And so we've got candidates going at it. We've got people going at it. We've got people who are contracting a disease and are very, very sick, some of them even dying. And and so it caused us to ask, God, what, what exactly are you doing? What's happening here? What's going on in the world? And, and here's the thing. And I, I don't I mean I don't mean to be a, a Debbie Downer a little bit, but we recognize that there are some things that we know about. For example, we know that medical science will never be able to keep up with viruses. I pray that today they find a cure for COVID-19 or at least a vaccination. But we also know that once they do that, guess what's around the corner? COVID-20 or COVID-21, whatever. I don't know how they call that, but but whatever that is, it's going to be the next thing. We also know, unfortunately, that law enforcement and injustice are going to collide from time to time. And that brings out many times respectable protesters that want to take a stand. It also brings out not so respectable people that just want to pillage and loot. That's the way it is. It's always been that way. We also know that being a political year, that whatever candidate you are going to vote for, that person is promising a ton and they will deliver very little. We know that going in. And we've, as Christians, we recognize that. We're, we're used to that kind of stuff. That's the world, and we know that. And one of the things that makes it so weird for us is that God is now doing something with the church globally, not just in Sacramento, not just in California, not just in the world, but, or in the, in the States, but worldwide. God is doing something so strange to the church And we just don't know, for whatever reason, God has said to the local churches in our area, stop. I I want you to stop doing what you've been doing and perhaps start doing something else. It's just for a season, but I want you to stop what you've been doing and doing something else. And the, the beautiful thing is, in God's word, God is a big fan of stoppage. He's a big fan of stop. In fact, in your Bibles, if you want to turn there, you can turn to Exodus 20, you can turn to Deuteronomy 5, or you can turn to Leviticus 25. We're going to end up at Leviticus 25 in a few minutes. But we see there that God gives us three different observances that all involve stopping. 
He calls it the Sabbath. Now, you know all about the Sabbath. The Hebrew form of that is Shabbat. All it means is just stop. Shabbat even sounds like a word that you would use for stop. And so God gives the children of Israel, as they're coming into the promised land, he gives them these three different observances, three different commands that all involve Shabbat, Sabbath, stop. And this morning, we're going to just look at those three areas very, very quickly because today's message is really kind of a, a trailer for the coming sermon series about the shocking life. Because whatever God is doing with us, I believe, I believe that he wants to shock the world. And he will do that perhaps by shocking you and me so that we can live that shocking life that draws people to Christ. And I want to spend the next few weeks to unpack what that looks like, what that sounds like. We're going to get super, super practical. But today I just want to lay the groundwork for this. Because whatever God wants of the church, we know this much. Whatever we've been doing up to this point, he wants it to stop. Now, we might pick up again next week or next month or next year, but somewhere along the way, we will gather back together. And I so look forward to that day. But until then, he's saying, I want you to stop. And we find out in God's word that he's a big fan of stop. So there's a couple of expressions, a couple of places where he does that. The first one is this, every seventh day, every seventh day, I want you to stop. And he says, I want you to rest for your sake. Now, there are a couple of places in the Old Testament where God commands the children of of Israel to do that. The first time is what we know as the Ten Commandments. And it says this in Exodus chapter 20. Remember the Sabbath day. It's the seventh day. It would be our Saturday to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it, you shall not do any work. And so God says on that seventh day, whatever you've been doing from day one to day six, stop. Stop. Shabbat. Sabbath. And I want you to do something differently. Why? Why, God? Why would you want us to do that? Well, he gives the reason here. For in the six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. I want you to stop on the seventh day because I did. When I created the heavens and the earth, there was morning and evening in the first six days. No morning and evening necessarily on the seventh day. The seventh day is still going. God is still resting because he basically created this beautiful world and said to Adam and Eve and all their descendants, sick them. Here you go. Build, create, love, develop. Now, obviously, we know the story. They didn't do that. They sinned, and they were kicked out of the garden, and that's when the resting stopped for us. But to draw us back to that, God says, I want you to stop, and I want you to rest because that's exactly what I did on the seventh day. But then fast forward 40 years, 40 years of the nation of Israel wandering in the wilderness, and we get to the second time when Moses downloads the Ten Commandments to the children of Israel, and he says this in Deuteronomy chapter 5, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. So there again, he's saying that whole Sabbath day I talked to you about 40 years ago with the Ten Commandments, that's still in play. I want you to still do that. But he gives a different reason. Look at this. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath. You see what happened here? Same command, different reason. In the Exodus account, God says, I want you to keep the Sabbath because I did, because I'm the creator. I am your creator. But here in Deuteronomy chapter 5, God says, I want you to keep the Sabbath for another reason. And that reason is because I'm also the liberator. I'm the one who set you free. So either case, as the children of Israel observe this seventh day Sabbath, they are to remember their creator. They are to remember the fact that they were set free, that God did these mighty things. It really is about God. It's not about them. It's about who God is. But it was also a gift them. So that's the seventh day. We know that. We're the most familiar with that one. 
But then if you want to flip over to Leviticus 25, there's another kind of a Sabbath. And this one is the every seventh year Sabbath. And the purpose of this one is to rest for the land's sake. The first seven-day Sabbath, it's for the Israelites' sake. It's for them to rest. But the seventh-year Sabbath, it's for the land. And it stands to reason, especially if you've ever lived in an agrarian area, when you're growing something constantly, it is sucking nutrients out of the soil because the soil is using the nutrients to make the plants healthy. That's just how God works. But there comes a time when the soil has nothing else to give. And, and, and so God knows that. He created this world. And so he says, you need to give the land a rest. And so he says this in Leviticus 25, for six years, you shall sow your field, and for six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its fruit. But in the seventh year, there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You work the field for six years. You work the vineyard for six years. You do as best as you can to develop a cash crop. But on that seventh year, you leave it alone. You let the vines grow, you let the soil do whatever it's going to do, and you live off of whatever it produces. You're not to make any money, you're to let the land rest. Now that's one that we may not know that much about, the seventh year Sabbath. But then there's one more, one more time in the rhythm of the Israelites' life where God says, I want you to stop. It's not the seventh day. It's not the seventh year, it's actually the 50th year. Every 50th year, renewal for everyone's sake. And what he's talking about there is this year called the year of Jubilee. Jubilee in the English, in the Hebrew, it's yobel. It means ram's horn or trumpet. That on the day of atonement, the trumpet would sound and that would declare on the 50th year, the year of Jubilee. So what's going on here? Let's find out in Leviticus 25. You shall count seven weeks of years, which is seven years, seven times seven years, so that the time of the seven weeks of years shall give you 49 years. Then you shall sound the loud trumpet, that's where we get the word, the Yobel, Jubilee, on the 10th day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement, you shall sound the trumpet throughout all your land, and you shall consecrate the 50th year. That 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. In it, you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of itself, nor gather the grapes from the undressed vines. So, all right, up to this point, understand this, because a lot of you probably are doing the math. Okay, 49 years, that means that there are seven, seventh year Sabbaths. And so they're just coming off a seventh year Sabbath. And now God's saying on the 50th year, I want you to do another kind of Sabbath. So for two years, two years, the land rests. What is the purpose of Jubilee? It is, it is God saying stop on steroids. Absolutely. And it's a strange strange holiday. And it produces, or it has three different qualities or expressions to it. Here's the first one. The, thir the first quality of Jubilee is the slaves are set free. Look at this in Leviticus 25. <clears throat> and you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all of its inhabitants. It shall be a Jubilee for you when each of you shall return to his property and each of you shall return to his clan. One of the great benefits of the year of Jubilee is that slaves are set free. Now, we need to understand slaves in that culture as opposed to ours. Slaves in that culture were enslaved not for racial purposes or because of racial purposes, but because of financial ones. So if you and I are doing business and, and I, uh, I need to buy something from you, I don't have the cash, you loan me the money, I, I become in debt to you and I find out that I don't have the collateral, or maybe my crop didn't come in, so I can't pay you back with money or with crop, so therefore I have to pay you back with myself. I become indentured to you. I become a slave to you, and we work out an agreement that I will work for you for a certain amount of time as your slave, as your servant. But now that sounds like 
typical way to do business, I suppose. But here's the problem with that. If I go to work for you, then I leave my land neglected. And so what do I do with my land? Well, I lease it out or I sell it out so that it can still, so I can make some money off of that. And you see what happens is that all of a sudden, the people of power, the people of influence, they, they gather all of these slaves, they accumulate all of these slaves, and it's very, very bad for a culture. And so on the year of Jubilee, when that ram's horn sounds, guess what? I'm free. I'm set free. I am no longer beholden to you. I've been set free. But there's something else that happens as well on Jubilee. Property is returned. In the book of Joshua, as the children of Israel are going into the promised land, Joshua sees to it that all of the 12 tribes of Israel are allotted land in the promised land fairly. And what I mean by fairly is that the largest tribes they get a larger portion of land than the smaller tribes. And then the tribes, they decide among the clans who gets property. It was all meant to be equitable. But you know what happens, right? You do business. You do business with another tribe, and, and, and that tribe has soil that you need to be able to grow what you want to grow, and so you, you do some business with them. You sell some property, or you donate some property, or you donate a flock or some seed or whatever, and you're doing business. And all of a sudden, what can happen so many times is that your grandfather did some business deals that didn't turn out very well for your clan. And the problem is because he did some bad business decisions. Your whole family now is enslaved to that tribe. And you'll never get out. You'll always be beholden to that tribe. Year of Jubilee, not only are you set free, but you get the original land back that you were allotted during the time of Joshua. It's a complete reset for the entire nation. It's a complete overhaul of the entire nation. How incredible would that be if that happens? And that's what happens with property. You take risks, you do business, you get in debt. Sometimes the decisions aren't that great and you pay for it. Well, you may have to pay for it, but your grandchildren shouldn't have to pay for it. And see, that's the unique thing about the year of Jubilee. It was meant to happen probably once in a lifetime. Once in a generation, the year of Jubilee would happen so that everything is reset and you get back to the way things were and you start all over. Again, it was a great year. Now, for those of you who are more business-minded, you're already thinking, wait a minute here. Every business, EI, business deal I do, I will have to do in lieu of the year of Jubilee. Exactly right. Everything that you, every transaction you make is in conjunction with the year of Jubilee. It's an incredible way. It's, it's a genius of God to even think of doing that. But then there's something else that's produced. Uh, go ahead and go to the third one. Yeah, thank you. Return to simplicity and fresh stories of God's faithfulness. It's a return to simplicity. Think about this. The children of Israel, while they were slaves in Egypt, it was a hard life, but it was a simple life. You get up every morning, you go and make bricks, you come home. You do it the next day, and the next day, and the next day, nothing good about that life, but it was pretty simple. Not a lot of decision-making to be made, except maybe to just stay invisible, don't stick out. But then all of a sudden, they're set free, and they're in the wilderness, and life is still difficult, but it's just as simple. All you got to do is wake up every morning, get enough manna for that day, and wait for that cloud to move. And when that cloud moves, that's when you move. Not a lot of decision-making going on. It sounds pretty enticing for us now because we've got dozens of decisions that we've got to make every day. But one of the things of Jubilee is to return to that simplicity that you've got two-year stint, the seventh-year Sabbath and the year of Jubilee, where you wake up in the morning there's no job to go to. There's no ground to till, no seeds to plant, no vines to prune, nothing to harvest, and you're just simply trusting that God will provide for you. It is a simple life. You're not out there making money. You're not out there doing investments and doing business. It's a simple life. God wants you to return to that simplicity. But then also, 
He wanted the children of Israel to have fresh stories of God's faithfulness. Think about this now. You were a small child. Maybe you weren't even born when the children of Israel were let out of Egypt, but you've heard stories of the 10 plagues. You've heard stories of the Red Sea crossing. You've heard stories of the manna, though you've never tasted it. You heard story of the water coming from the rock. You've heard stories about the sandals that never wore out or the bronze snake. You've heard all of these incredible stories of God moving among the people, but that's what they all are, are just stories. That's all they are. The stories that grandma and granddad tell that we've never seen, they say they have, but it seems like it's kind of removed. What the year of Jubilee is, is God in his graciousness saying to your children, to my children, to your grandchildren, to my grand... Did you know I was a granddad? I don't know if you knew that or not. I haven't told you that in a while, but I am. It's God's way to say, I want your children, I want your grandchildren to have fresh stories of my provision, of my power. And so during the year of Jubilee, I will command a blessing over you and you can trust me. I will provide for you and I will bless you. And you will have your own stories of God's fresh power and his faith. Take a look at this in verse 18. Therefore, you shall do my statutes and keep my rules and perform them, and then you will dwell on the land securely. That word securely is huge, because isn't that not what we're looking for? Everything that we do, so much of what we do anticipate is for our own security. God knows that. He wants to be that for them. The land will yield its fruit and you will eat your fill and dwell in it securely. There it is again, securely. I am going to see that the land will yield enough food for you to survive. You will eat and you will thrive and you will be secure. He goes on. And if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year? If we may not sow or gather in our crop, This is the beauty, it's tucked away in the text, but this is so beautiful. I, God is saying, I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year so that it will produce a crop sufficient for three years. I'm commanding you to place yourself in a situation where you need to trust me. God is addressing, and God's expectation for his people was not to acquire land. It was not to accrue slaves or wealth. That's not his intention. His intention was not to say, here's the promised land, now get wealthy, get prosperous, own a bunch of slaves, and multiply your business. That's not why he gave them the promised land. He gave them the promised land because he wanted them to see how he provides wealth, how he provides security, how he provides blessing. That's why. And so that's why he gives the seventh day Sabbath, the seventh year Sabbath, and the year of Jubilee is to have them automatically place themselves in a situation where they must trust God. You see what he's doing? And the, the, the unique thing about this is that all of this is meant to be a gift to God's people. It was never meant to be a chore. It was never meant to be a point of anxiety or worry. It was meant to be a gift to them. It was also meant to be a billboard. Imagine that you're a surrounding nation and and, and you're watching Israel and you're seeing this and, and you're seeing the people thrive. They're growing crops, they're growing vineyards and it's just amazing, it's just exploding, it's just beautiful and you're thinking, oh my goodness, their God must be blessing them. And then all of a sudden you notice that everything stopped. The vineyards are kind of looking kind of sloppy. They're not being pruned. Nothing is being harvested. The sheep aren't being sheared. What's going on with that? And so you talk to one of your Jewish neighbors across the line and says, yeah, it's the year of Jubilee. Huh? It's the year where we just stop. And all the slaves are set free. Slaves are set free? Yeah. And we get our old property back. You get your old property back? Yeah. Why? Our God is faithful. He has always taken care of us. He will always take care of us. And so we trust him. That kind of a story was meant to be a billboard to the nations, 
going all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, God told Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Why? So that you will bless all other nations. So, here's the question. Did they do it? Did they observe the seventh day Sabbath? Did they observe the seventh year Sabbath? Did they observe the year of Jubilee? Well, if you flip over to the New Testament, if you're reading through the Gospels, you find out that more often than not, the Pharisees got ticked at Jesus. Why? Because in their mind, he violated the Sabbath. He was, they were always looking at Jesus on the Sabbath. You're, you're doing miracles. You're, your disciples are picking grain. You're doing things that you shouldn't be doing on the Sabbath. Jesus was not disobeying the law of God. He was disobeying their law. But what about the seventh year Sabbath or the year of Jubilee? Is there anything in God's word or in historical record that the nation of Israel observed the seventh year Sabbath or the year of Jubilee? Nope. No place. In fact, there's a verse or two tucked away in 2 Chronicles 36. I know it's a flyover book of the Bible, but in 2 Chronicles 36, is giving the account of the children of Israel being captured and taken back into Babylon in captivity. And you remember how long they were in captivity? They were there. Maybe it's a trivial question for today. I don't know. But they were there in captivity for 70 years. Why 70? Is that just an arbitrary number that God picked? Why 70 years? Check out 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 20. He took into exile in Babylon those, talking about Nebuchadnezzar, he took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. You know what this is saying? Israel, you're going to be in captivity for 70 years because you violated the seven-year Sabbath 70 times. 490 years worth of violating the seven-year Sabbath, you violate it 70 times, guess what? If you don't let the land rest, I will let the land rest because the land will rest. I have deemed it to be so. So Israel... Disobeyed the seven-year Sabbath. There's no indication they obeyed the year of Jubilee. And before we sit in judgment of them, frankly, I understand their disobedience. I understand why they would do that. You see, because I don't, I would never want to, and this is probably true confession. You may want to switch churches after you hear this, but I, I don't think I'd ever want to put myself in a situation where my only recourse is to trust God. It's just so counterintuitive for me. It may not be for you, but it is for me. I I would never want to put myself in a corner where unless God does it, it won't happen. I, I would never want to do that deliberately. And that's exactly what God was asking them to do in the seventh year Sabbath and the year of Jubilee. I want you to put yourself willingly in a situation where if I don't come through, you don't survive. Could it be that's what God's doing here? Could it be that that is exactly what Jesus is doing with his church right now? I want you to stop, and I want you to stop for my sake, because I am God. I want you to be in a situation where unless I move, nothing happens. I've got a really great quote by a woman named Lim Babb who's done a lot of writing on the Sabbath. And I just love this because it resonates with me in my own mind. Sabbath is a time to stop to refrain from being seduced by our desires, to stop working, stop making money, Stop spending money, see what you have, 
Look around, listen to your life. Do you really need more than this? Spend a day with your family, just stop. And I love this line, you cannot buy stopped. You simply have to stop. What is that saying to you right now in your own life? Because whether you like it or not, God has said to stop. And here he has said this in three different ways. Every seventh day, every seventh day, you stop, you rest, you trust. Every seventh year, you stop, you rest, you trust. Every 50th year, you stop, reset, and trust. What does that look like with COVID? I, I, I want you to know up front, I am not asking, and I'm not pitching to us that we should do a Sabbath, a seven-year Sabbath or a 50-year Sabbath, year of Jubilee. I wrote my whole dissertation on the year of Jubilee to get my doctorate, and you could read that, or you can just wait for the movie. Either way, it's fine, you know, but uh, no, I think I've got like 15 copies of it, so you can, uh, you can I'm, I'm glad to loan you one of those. But here's why we're doing this. God loves it when we stop for his sake. He's a big fan of stopping. What we have done as a church for the last 70 years, and really what every other church in our country has done for many, many years, is they have gathered together and they have worked and they have labored together for the glory of Christ to do great and wonderful things for Christ. And for whatever reason, March 15th, Jesus said, it's going to stop. It's going to stop. So what what does that look like to us as a church? I I got to tell you, before COVID hit, uh, John Hatfield, Patrick, and Sally George, and myself, under the charge of the elders, we got together about a year ago. We had about eight or nine meetings to work out some five-year goals, some robust, aggressive goals where we could trust God. And we were excited about those. We, we downloaded them to the, to the elders several months ago. And the elders did their tweaking and we adjusted those things. And right about now, in fact, it would have been probably this Sunday, we would have rolled those goals out and says, this is what we're going to do for the next five years. And then COVID hit, and we took that as God saying, hey, boys, you need to stop. Pump the brakes. I'm doing a thing that may not be in line with your goals. Get this, what what would happen? Just imagine for a moment, all right? Just, Just imagine. If Jesus, on March 15th, were to walk onto our campus, our beautiful campus here. And he's looking around the buildings. And some of our staff people, they see who he is. They recognize who he is. And they're so excited. And and so they want to give him a tour. And they take turns giving Jesus a tour to allow him to see what he has done on this campus, to see the thousands of lives that have been transformed as a result over the last 70 years on this campus. And so they just, they just take Jesus for a tour and, and they want Jesus to see all of the beauty that he's created, all of the work, all of the transformed lives that he has done over the years. What would that look like? Just imagine, would you? Jesus, can you believe this building has been in use for over 70 years? How many generations is that that have heard the truth of who you are and your word? Now we use it for kids ministry and kids are coming to know who you are because of this building. Hey Jesus, this space that you've given us is a space that we use for middle school and high school small groups. This is a place where we connect small groups of students to caring adults that show them what it looks like to follow you. All for your glory. Jesus. We want to get as many students as possible to hear, see, and follow you. And this is where we do most of that. It's such a blessing to be able to do it the way you do it. We get as many students as we can get to come in these doors, and then we connect them to people that are going to love them and teach them everything that you've taught us. It is so exciting, and it's all for your glory. Jesus, thank you so much for this church that you've given us. It's a privilege to be a steward of this place, from the parking lots that we all park in, to the roofs that we uh, have to protect us from the elements. 
It's a place that you've given us and it's all for your glory. Jesus, look at this space you have given to us. We've created a place where people can come and grab a cup of coffee prior to service. We can pray with each other, and what a great place for a guest to come, grab a cup of coffee before going into service, and this is all for your glory. Lord, you have gifted us this beautiful space where we can gather together in community, whether that's our choir, our orchestra, and our band, and we experience the joy of the Lord here, and we do this all for your glory, Lord. And we don't just gather to sing, we take time to worship, we take time to pray together in a large group, in a small group together, and we take time to walk in your love and know more about you. And we do all this to prepare music and to prepare our hearts as we can lead our congregation in worship every Sunday morning, and it's all for your glory. Jesus, in this room, for decades, you've used the gifts of many generations and the blessings of technology and music to lead people to worship you and to draw many into your kingdom. All of it for your glory. That'd be pretty cool if Jesus stepped on our campus and he could see the tools that he's given us to help as many people as possible to hear, see, and follow Jesus. But clearly, he has said to us, I don't want this to be a tool for a season. I, I don't want you to use this campus. But I still want you to help as many people as possible to hear, see, and follow Jesus. And there will be a day when we will gather back together and it's going to be an incredible blowout celebration, a worship of Jesus Christ our Lord. And he will love that. But until then, he does not want us on the sidelines. He does not want us to just sit on our hands and wait for the governor to say what he's going to say or to wait for the disease to go away. He wants us to be the church. And the next few weeks, it will be my pleasure to talk about that. What, what does that look like for us if this keeps remaining the same? What does that look like? Or, or even if we do come back together, what does it look like? For whatever reason, Jesus is saying to us, I want you to see the mission differently. And so what could that look like? I, I really hope that you can tune in with us online. Maybe sometime during this series, we'll be able to have meetings together. But if not, that you can be able to come back online and we can be able to see exactly what Jesus would want for us to do during this time of stoppage, and yet we're starting. And we'll talk about that in the weeks to come. Let's pray. Almighty God, we have heard you loud and clear. The governor is not running our church. The county is not running our church. The president is not running our church. You are. And you have said that the gates of hell or any other virus will not be able to stand in your way. So Lord God, I hope that what you see in us, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, is we have not stopped anything because you are our rest. Jesus is our jubilee. And so Father, we can be able to rest to know that you will command blessing. And so, Lord God, give us wisdom. Give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see what you would want us to do during this time and after. Clearly, you want it to be different than it was. We hope that what you see in us are faithful servants of the Most High God. We praise you. We thank you. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another. That together with one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another. And that means you may have to go across the street for the glory of God. And we all say together, for the glory of God. Have a great day. I love you. What can you do this week to stop, to Sabbath? Maybe you can join us online day and night, 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday through Friday. It's an opportunity where we as a church can just stop and look to Jesus and give him that moment. We'd love to see you there, Facebook and Instagram, Monday through Friday. And we love you guys, and we can't wait to see you in person. Have a fantastic week.